there was uh, that reminded me gardener those who have um, studied child psychology and education howard gardener his famous multiple intelligences uh, seven intelligences before the class i looked it up today now they're speaking about eight but anyway when we learned it it was seven intelligences so his thesis was that our culture values um only one kind of intelligence he considers that to be intelligent and that which is you know you get good grades in school in college for that and you go to ivy league but that's only one kind of intelligence there are multiple kinds of intelligence and it's only after gardner that it was recognized otherwise uh, it would be like this kid is intelligent other kids are dumb no they might have uh, you know other kinds of intelligence so gardner spoke about the two kinds of intelligence which are valued in our culture all all, all throughout especially modern culture is what he called verbal linguistic intelligence you're good with words you know you can speak write well and all of that you read well some kids are really good at that the second one is logical mathematical so you're very good with analytical skills you you're really good at engineering and all of that and maths so these two are really praised you're good at science or in the humanities but then there's another skill the uh, what is called spatial skill artists architects see sri ramakrishna says i could paint very well uh, architects artists they have that spatial skill then there is something called a kinesthetic skill so dance sports some have extraordinary coordination uh, physical it's a, it's a physical intelligence but it's a kind of intelligence uh, which is you know why some make it to the juilliard and others can't so this is a um, they have that rhythm um, kinesthetic intelligence then there is uh, something called uh, musical intelligence music and rhythm musical rhythm rhythmical intelligence uh, then there is interpersonal intelligence some people are really good with people uh, and actually these are the ones who are likely to succeed you know in management in politics and so on good with people that's a kind of that's a extremely important kind of intelligence the and leaders generally have it um intrapersonal intelligence means you're quite aware and understand yourself not in the vedantic sense of i am the atman or brahman but in the sense of uh, understanding my one's own feelings activities strengths and weaknesses character yeah. so intrapersonal so that's the seven and now that i saw they have introduced another one natural intelligence which talks about understanding nature and living things some people are really good with plants pets with the environment and things like that anyway now notice sri ramakrishna he says i can't understand math my, it would make my head spin but he was not only good at painting he was good at he, as a little kid he would make beautiful sculptures uh, clay models of um, you know, gods and goddesses and worship it he had a tremendous memory he would uh, just learn entire plays by by heart just listening to the plays even without the book um uh, he, he could draw very well he could of course sing extraordinarily well all his life he could sing and dance very well so almost every other area of intelligence and of course words he was this master at um, teaching using words word play only this strange weakness in math <laughs> <laughs> and notice it's so this uh, dialogue is constructed so well the author m he doesn't fail to notice that after saying that my head spins i could paint very well on the way back he enters the house and sees the painting of yashoda and says this is not well done <laughs> <laughs> i'm going to skip ahead a little bit yes there's a microphone here yeah I just have a question about the arithmetic. Is this uh, does this correspond with uh I think it's in the Kothamrito where he says I haven't come here to subtract? I yeah. Mean, That's right. I've only come to add. There was a word play here that he has come to unite and not to subtract. He affirms the truth of all spiritual paths. He brings people together and so they come to unite in that sense. <laughs> But it's also true. Not only that, there are some other things he couldn't do. Um 
he couldn't uh, what was that um, you know put the buttons on a shirt or something like that is there uh, i forgot an ex- there's some things he found it very difficult it was just it is kind of psychological dislike for uh, for for that kind of thing yeah so other is this very accomplished young man and the deputy magistrate in those days he has come and he asks sri ramakrishna this is his first visit this is at the bottom of the page 185 um what about animal sacrifice because kali is a deity to which animals were sacrificed goats were sacrificed is that is that right isn't it uh, killing isn't it bad how can it be part of religion sri ramakrishna doesn't agree and and, and agree entirely he says that no there are rituals so on a special puja occasion a special ritual a goat may be sacrificed there's nothing wrong in it however he says um i can't see animals being killed uh, i mean so and he gives a humorously he says because animals are sacrificed goats are sacrificed before the divine mother and the meat is considered prasada offered food now you cannot refuse offered food and so sri ramakrishna he says what i do is i touch one finger to that dish when it's offered to me and i put it put a dot on my head so that the mother is not annoyed with me that i'm not <laughs> but he says i can't bear it if uh, uh, animals are killed then then he says he goes further i see god in all beings and then he says the result of it which is is that even if a certain being dies i am consoled by knowing that the divinity within it he says the soul is beyond life and death it is the death of the body i can clearly see that and then notice it is something he is telling other one should not reason too much and he says it's enough if one loves the lotus feet of the mother if you get devotion to god that's enough if your reasoning takes you there that's good don't keep on digging into it again then you'll again get confused and he gives a very nice example you get clear water if you drink from the surface of a pool put your hand deeper and stir the water and it becomes muddy <laughs> yeah the intellect is a tool it's an instrument which helps us to get at a certain conclusion but if you just go on uh, uh, you know on the basis of argument you can't argue your way to god that's the thing and that's the, that's why the importance of scripture the vedas of the upanishads here are the experiences of enlightened beings that they have set it down for you which you will never get to by thinking freely so what the upanishads say my reasoning can take me there does reasoning have no role at all to play no reasoning has a role to play first of all the reasoning itself logical thinking will give you will enable you to discover the meaning of the upanishads meaning of the texts not only that it will also help to make it rational vivekananda said man must not only have faith but also have intellectual faith too your intellect to the extent that you can think it should say this is correct this is uh, logical rational but that's it yeah. and then he gives two kinds of two kinds of devotion dhruva's devotion there was desire and then uh, prahlada's there was no desire motiveless so if you have desire he connects it back to what he was saying about this world if you have desire and you have devotion to god and you ask for what you want you will get what you want if you have no desire that means no worldly desire you have you have a desire for god you want god then you will get god and there were these people very funny things you know in the gospel itself you find there was hajra a skeptic who was spiritual but also skeptical and also very materialistic and he would hang around sri ramakrishna consider himself to be very spiritual and he'd look at sri ramakrishna giving advice to others he would also give advice he would, he would be very pompous uh, and he would sit as, as outside and he would tell these young men who came around sri ramakrishna he said don't let him fool you when he would say that they you know they would say sri ramakrishna said only love god and god realization is the goal give up worldly desires and he said don't let him fool you ask him for both why can't he give you both <laughs> you can become enlightened and you can become rich and powerful and famous in the world and sri ramakrishna <laughs> scolded him strongly and he said don't listen to him he has a very petty mind you know 
I can't let go of the. It's like I want the pineapple and also the prickly leaves around the pineapple. Well, Swami Ashokanji said, "It's like saying, yes, there is nectar and there is poison." So when his people say, "You have both, I have a balanced life," it's like having a sip of nectar and a sip of poison. Why? <laughs> Then, a direct question. How can one realize God through that kind of love, the li that motiveless love, desireless love? Desireless means no desire for the world. I have seen it. This is it. I have had enough of it. Good. It will go on in its own way. I don't want you to rearrange things in the world in my favor. But what I want, I do want something. I want you. I want you, my Lord. I want deep devotion for you. I want this... Um, you know, my mind to be stilled in meditation, in prayer. I want to have a heart which is you know, selfless, which converts every one of my actions as a service, as a worship of you, my Lord. And finally, I want that knowledge of, of reality, of what you are and what I am, that identity, that Aham Brahma, Asmi, I am Brahman. These are the things we want and, and it is encouraged in spiritual life. This is what we should want. You know, people think that, oh, so you're completely desirous, you don't want anything. That seems rather strange. Um, how? Why would one engage in such a great undertaking without any particular motive? There is a clear motive: uh, moksha, liberation, nirvana, enlightenment, salvation, going beyond suffering, attaining attaining fulfillment. The same thing that motivated Vivekananda. The same thing that motivated uh, Buddha. So there is a motivation. How can one realize God through that kind of love? But one must force one's demand on God. One should be able to say, Oh God, will thou not reveal thyself to me? I will cut my throat with a knife. That is the tamas of bhakti. Devotee. So the crucial question here. Can one see God? Master. Yes, surely. One can see both aspects of God. God with form and without form. That means the Advaitic realization that I am Brahman. That is possible. Or the dualistic devotional approach where I love God in this form, um, you know, as my father in heaven or as, um, as Vishnu or the divine mother uh, Kali. I love God in this form and I want to experience God in this way. Can you experience, can you actually see that? Yes, you can. You can actually experience a most um, powerful experience, life transforming experience one can have. Vision of God. And then a third one he introduces, Sri Ramakrishna. Again, God can be directly perceived in a man with a tangible form. Seeing an incarnation of God is the same as seeing God himself. God is born on earth as a man, as man in every age. Sort of indicating that he is an incarnation. So seeing an incarnation is seeing God. Um, one needs... Faith, of course, that I am actually seeing an incarnation. In the Gita, Sri Krishna warns Arjuna that those who think I am a mere human being, they will not attain, they, they will not get the results of this. He says, this is Krishna, he is my friend, that's it. No, uh, Krishna is an incarnation of God. So that faith, and that faith is also given by the grace of God. It doesn't come easily. So, in three ways, he has given three ways. One is the Advaitic realization of Satchidananda, existence, consciousness, bliss, and you will realize that you are that. That is liberation, that is God realization, that is God vision, that is experience. Or the devotional way of experiencing God as Vishnu, a father in heaven, the divine mother, experiencing actually having a vision, feeling the presence of God, very real, not theoretical. Or seeing an incarnation and believing and having faith that this is an incarnation of God. Yes. Then March 11, 1883. It was Sri Ramakrishna's birthday. You, you had a question? Yeah, so there's a, a two questions there and one in the front. Uh, Swamiji Pranam, you mentioned um, the faith in acknowledging an incarnation when one sees one. Uh, is is not doing that a bigger error than uh, not somebody who's not an incarnation, but you have faith that they are. So, for example, even currently, 
if we scour enough, we will find that various communities believe four or five or maybe more people as incarnations. Yeah. Uh, is there an error in perceiving somebody as an incarnation when yeah, they're so not? So this is um, like the water becoming muddy if you put your hand too deep in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's a difficult thing to say, but incarnations are few and rare. We believe in our order and in the Ramakrishna Vivekananda movement, we believe Sri Ramakrishna to be an incarnation of God. However, Vivekananda has left it quite open. He says, you may take him as an incarnation of God. You may take him as a great saint. You may take him as a Jivan Mukta perfected uh, uh, master. The main thing is to you know, follow and do what he has told us to do. So he's kept it quite open. But in our uh, tradition, we believe him to be an incarnation of God. Um, so you can go to two different extremes. One extreme is, um, say, the Christians believe that there was only one incarnation of God, that is Jesus Christ, and no more. Not before that, nor after that. The only one uh, begotten Son of God. That we don't agree. We agree there have been multiple incarnations. But because of this openness in Hinduism, there is a surfeit of incarnations. That also doesn't seem to be quite right. Uh, too many incarnations all the time. <laughs> uh, as uh, Swami Ashokanji said, in the 1960s in Berkeley, the beginning of the hippie, mo- hippie, hippie movement, he said, Oh, Berkeley, blessed place, an incarnation at every street corner. <laughs> <laughs> it's the beginning of the New Age movement, you know, it's so much. So incarnations are not that cheap. Now, your specific question was, Suppose I believe in somebody who is not an incarnation, but I believe that he is an incarnation, he or she is an incarnation. Is that wrong? It's quite wrong if that person encourages it. I know quite clearly that I'm not an incarnation. Now, if I encourage people to believe that I am an incarnation, or lead, lead them on, or at least not deny it outright, then that would be wrong. However, faith by itself is not wrong. I remember, this is not about incarnation, it's about something much lower, a guru. So I was in the Himalayas and there was this one Baba who was quite famous and uh, there were some uh, charges against him, so some kind of stories going around about him. And I met this monk who was a disciple of that, that teacher. And that monk used to stay in, in a cottage near ours. <laughs> and I really liked this monk, he was an elderly man. He was a householder from uh, Rajasthan, a simple man. He had you know, completed his household duties, his children had grown up, he had given his business, uh, his work property to the children, and he had left home and become a monk in old age. But a very simple, uh, straightforward man. And he had this wholehearted faith in that Baba. Now, that same question which you have, uh, I had the same question. I asked uh, a senior monk, what will happen? Because suppose that teacher is not really a, really a good you know, advanced spiritual person and this person has this undiluted faith in his, uh, in the, in his master. <laughs> the monk laughed and said, the, the disciple will go to heaven, the teacher will go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, faith is a great power. But it's a great responsibility on the teacher, let alone incarnation. It's a very big thing to claim. But even the others, uh, to not to claim more than what they truly are. People really want to believe. And they will immediately believe it. This leads to exploitation. and um, you know, it's, it's, uh, So too many incarnations is a big question mark. It's unlikely that there will be a bunch of incarnations all the time. Um, I often think that the uh, injunction against you know, no other prophets after Prophet Muhammad in Islam, you have to look at the context in which it was made. Immediately after the Prophet Muhammad, immediately there were pretenders who also claimed that we are also prophets and we are getting messages from Allah and you do this or you do that. And so this injunction was put in place. That's to stop this kind of thing from happening. But that has it's a, it has got its own um, problems. It can lead to narrowness and fanaticism in time. And a denial of any possibility of any kind of you know, uh, incarnation ever coming again. So, 
that's the answer i would always my instinct is to go straight back to advaita vedanta and say all that's very good but it ultimately <laughs> what you are that's the important thing and that doesn't depend on incarnation or no incarnation it's the truth about one's own reality yes this gentleman here so um hi my name is meher i have a question about uh the ritual of like animal sacrifice like does that implicitly imply that like man can shri ramakrishna is saying man can access god above other organisms on earth even so like over trees flowers etc if every if everything is brahman then like why would something like a uh, sacrifice be okay yeah one is whether only the human being can attain uh, god realization and that was a general understanding in all indian systems that the human birth is very privileged and very special and so this birth is meant for spiritual realization this is where the door to enlightenment is open second the origin of these sacrifices i think it was sacrifices you give up something that is valuable to you and remember animals were wealth in ancient times so you are actually giving up something that's really close and val- valuable to you uh, but and remember religions have evolved over time vivekananda himself when we have a big puja in uh, of durga puja in the monastery he said we should have a sacrifice we should sacrifice a goat um, uh, masharda heard about it and said absolutely not there should be no uh, animal sacrifice in the monastery and somebody said it to see how wise she was that was the small and humble beginning in those days now it's an enormous event one of the major puja events uh, the durga puja in in belur math and if he had started that at that time today there would be a river of blood running down to the ganga uh, so she put a complete stop to it so does that mean it was wrong thousands of years ago no um, sri ramakrishna is very careful as a part of a special ritual you sacrifice a particular animal it was accepted you shouldn't condemn that but then there are extremes and it had gone to extremes one of the major reasons why the buddha revolted against this kind of ritualistic religion was animal sacrifice he absolutely wanted that to stop so religions have evolved now you see it's almost almost entirely gone yeah. even in um, traditions which had animal sacrifice at one time yeah let me read a little bit and then we'll take one or two more questions yes so sri ramakrishna's birthday many of his disciples and devotees wanted to celebrate the happy occasion of at dakshineshwar temple garden from early morning the devotees streamed in alone or in parties after the morning worship in the temples sweet music was played in the nahabat it was spring time the trees creepers and plants were covered with new leaves and blossoms the very air seemed seemed laden with joy and the hearts of the devotees were glad at on this auspicious day m arrived early in the morning and found the master talking smilingly to bhavanath rakhal and kali krishna m prostrated himself before him master to m i am glad you have come to the devotees one cannot be spiritual as long as one ha- one has shame hatred or fear great will be the joy today but those fools who will not sing or dance mad with god's name will never attain god how can one feel any shame or fear when the names of god are sung now sing all of you it's a little bit of a hint to m m remember he was a school teacher and these were all young boys so he was very formal and sort of uh, uh, up, you know stiff and he wasn't quite uh, comfortable singing and dancing he, he could sit and watch but or sing along but not you know stand up and dance in front of others so this is something that uh, sri ramakrishna is pointing out see w- shame hatred or fear where should one have shame hatred or fear and where one should not have so one has no shame in um, in on lots of uh, doing lots of worldly stuff 
and one has shame one feels a little um, uh, shy when it comes to singing the name of god uh, somebody asked me how can you go around in the united states dressed like this dressed so funny i said look i know what this stands for and i'm proud of it i am comfortable in it it really does i know some people might find it funny some people might you know comment on it it's all right it's uh, i mean it's understandable if you, so somebody said you're walking around dressed in an orange be- b- b- bed sheet <laughs> <laughs> some people say oh i like the color many people nowadays they recognize it that it's some kind of monastic dress many people think i am a hare krishna so they say hare krishna to me <laughs> and today i was walking uh, somebody said jai swami narayan <laughs> so i don't correct them it's all right i mean it's um, as long as they they rec- recognize it's some kind of monastic dress yes so one should not have shame when it comes to spirituality to god realization it's not something that i should keep hidden away don't go to the other extreme also the other extreme is imposing it on everyone left right and center whether they want to be interested they, they want to listen to you they don't want to listen to you you want to bring everybody to that path uh, yeah. uh, they make a pest of yourself don't do that and then um, hatred or fear these are strong emotions which will keep you away from um, uh, god realization if it is true it is the same brahman everywhere what can you really hate whom can you really hate if it is true it's the same brahman everywhere you are brahman the immortal in infinite existence consciousness bliss what will you be afraid of one sign of enlightenment is that you go beyond fear but not the beyond fear of the person who is you know a burglar or a crook or something uh, fearlessly uh, stealing no not that kind so where one has to apply shame hatred or fear and where one should be free of it great will be the joy today and so there are s- songs which are being sung bhavanath and his friend kali krishna sang thrice blessed is this day of joy may, may all of us unite o lord to preach thy true religion here in india's holy land and so on 187 next page as sri ramakrishna listened to the song with folded hands his mind soared to a far off realm he remained absorbed in meditation a long time after a while kali krishna whispered something to bhavanath then he bowed before the he um, bowed down before the master and rose sri ramakrishna was surprised he in bengali it is bishmoy bishmoy means in utter wonderment you know not just surprise just utter wonderment he asked where are you going bhavanath he is going away on a little business master what is it about bhavanath he is going to the baranagar working men's institute master it's his bad luck and the person left so it's his bad luck a stream of bliss will flow here today he could have enjoyed it but how unlucky mm. so this is a hint to us spiritual life spiritual aspiration spiritual practice spiritual gatherings talks and classes like this are very precious as we go through life we will find that this is what we cherish ultimately yeah. more and more as we mature and we go towards the end of this life we will cherish this and these opportunities come rarely you want it and it is available and it's right in front of you now imagine Sri Ramakrishna is there, and devotees, and Sri Ramakrishna is in ecstasy. Bhajans are being sung. The whole day will pass in spiritual talk, in meditation, in uh, singing, in the presence of someone like Sri Ramakrishna, and he has to go on business. And he just bows down at next thing, a to-do list, you know, ticked off. Sri Ramakrishna's birthday. I said happy birthday. Now off to the next, the Working Men's Institute. This was an educational institute. Good work, but no, no, nothing compared to this. You must stop all that and. participate in this there was this great pandit um who came to swami brahmananda in bhuvaneshwar long after sri ramakrishna had pass- passed and that pandit said i want to tell you something share a pain which has been there in my heart many many years ago when sri ramakrishna was uh, alive uh, in uh, in this human body in this mortal body and in dakshineshwar i had heard about sri ramakrishna and i set out to meet him to see him and on the way i suddenly thought 
but he knows in the hearts of all people he will surely see into my heart and see you know what kind of person i am or what my thoughts are and a fear seized me suppose he would expose me before everybody suppose i, w- I was i mean you know, he shows everybody what kind of person i am in public i am shamed of course sri ramakrishna would never do that but anyway that fear ca- came upon me and halfway he didn't go in any further he went back home and he never ever saw sri ramakrishna and he says this that has haunted me yeah, all my life and he started weeping bitterly i never saw him and then um, swami of course the story is very wonderful swami brahmananda said but you i have seen him no i never saw him you have seen him one who has seen the son has seen the father too so i am brahmananda is to be considered the spiritual son of sri ramakrishna you know um then this pandit he was weeping he bowed down before swami brahmananda and when he looked up he saw sri ramakrishna sitting there yeah. just for a moment he saw that anyway it is his bad luck don't go away i remember as a young monk once in the main monastery i was not yet a sanyasi i was a brahmachari novice i used to go to the library and sit and read and then i would go back to that place where i was posted for the whatever work so it was time for aarti evening aarti and the library closed monks were going to the main temple of sri ramakrishna and i thought i'll just go back to my room i finished reading i'll go on reading in my room i was walking away an old monk he was walking uh, towards the temple he saw me from a distance where are you off to i said um well i'm going back to my room and he said you won't go to the aarti i said i didn't say anything i said well i thought i was going to go back to my room and then the monk i still remember with so so much love and affection he grabbed my hand he said come on come with me come to the aarti and he took me to the aarti it was a great lesson <laughs> All right so somebody else had a question we'll end with that you yeah, the gentleman at the back Yes Pranam Swami ji um I listened to Eli Wiesel the novelist who was as a little boy in the concentration camps and one of the things he said is that he felt You actually met him No listen listen to him Yeah um i met his son okay, i worked with his son um so he um he was saying that he felt that god abandoned his people hmm. it's like he could not understand why that would happen and i was trying to connect your thoughts of being in god's hospital with this disease trying to connect with where does gratuitous suffering end and you know getting out of god's hospital start what what is the connection between these two concepts and how do we connect them in our heads hmm. so first of all what you say this is true this is a huge point of inflection in um jewish theology that how could the holocaust happen that 6 million people innocent people just snatched away from their lives put in to so much suffering and then murdered in mass concentration camps and then not just 6 million people 6 million jews but many others who survived the camps also they went through so much suffering that they were scarred for the rest of their lives you know um uh, and then the question is that how can god allow this kind of suffering but notice this is a, a an example of enormous proportions of great suffering of enormous proportions but suffering is there all throughout it's not that this is the only example of suffering and others are not suffering there is suffering there are cataclysms millions of people die there are wars there are there is disease we just came out of a pandemic and then is suffering at the uh, at the uh, individual level in every family in every person's life so i'm reading this a wonderful book the emperor of all uh, maladies it's on cancer uh, siddharth mukherjee he wrote this book so there he starts with it is a wonderful book really if you if you have read it or if you haven't read it 
uh, even as literature, it's it's really wonderful literature. It's very gripping. He lives here in New York. I heard uh, New York, right? You met him? No. In Colombia, he works in Colombia. So he starts with a quote from Susan Sontag. So Susan Sontag says, "All of us have dual citizenship. We have two passports. One in the country of the well, another the country of the of the ill, of the sick. And no matter how healthy we are, no matter how much we want to visit the country with the good passport, all of us are obliged to, even if for a short time, visit." that other country uh, he says the, the dwellers in the night he says that, that is the, the country of the sick country of the ill so suffering is there in everybody's life uh, and terrible huge suffering also this question was raised to me more than once by bill who's jewish bill conrad he fought in the second world war and he asked this question how could god permit a holocaust and the the conclusion drawn seems to be if this happens such a thing has happened then god doesn't exist see a compassionate god cannot permit such enormous suffering i often think yes compassionate god cannot permit such enormous suffering but why would a compassionate all powerful powerful god even permit a little bit of suffering the suffering of a little animal for example notice the way the world is designed suffering is inevitable Sri so Ramakrishna talks about the woman suffering a childbirth. Look at the cycle of nature. Predators eat their prey. Is doesn't the mouse suffer when the cat catches it? Doesn't the insect suffer when the the uh, lizard cat catches it? So suffering is built into the structure of nature. So why? And is this an argument for the non-existence of God? This is a big theological question. It's called the problem of evil. The problem of evil, problem of suffering. Uh, but there is natural evil which would happen because of nature uh, but there is also man made evil on purpose like the holocaust of causing enormous suffering to others so my qu- answer to him was so the argument is if such horrible things happen then actually god can't exist god would not permit such a thing i said to him two cases i'm presenting to you tell me which is worse one is See all those Jewish people who died in the Holocaust most of them at least they believed in God in some way or the other they had faith most of them they were religious people they had some faith now it could be true that they were right or it could be true that they were wrong right means god actually exists there is life after death that could be true or maybe they are wrong there is no god there is no life after death everything is there so In the second case, if there is no God, no life after death, which their religion told them that there is God, there is life after death. Suppose it was not true, then everything ended in the gas chambers of Auschwitz and Treblinka and other places. You know, you were most unjustly taken away from your family, from your life, and imprisoned and tortured and killed, and and nothing more. That's it. It's finished. That's the second case. The other case is. you were taken away unjustly tortured and killed but that's not the end of your story that's not the end of your story you still exist and you will go on in your spiritual path you know you develop and you know in your spiritual journey it will continue this was one story one chapter in um, a much larger uh, story of your spiritual evolution which one is a better option the first one is a better option if you especially if you ask that person in the concentration camp who is going to die of these two options which one would you prefer to be true they would say the first one if i'm going to die anyway if i'm going to if, if this uh, all hope is lost i would still have that much hope that god exists after life exists and my, this is part of a longer story not the only story that i have to me it does not show that god doesn't exist to me it makes it all the more urgent that god does exist why would god permit such a thing there are many many uh, answers to to that um, i have a book which gives you 24 answers <laughs> none of them very satisfying but anyway this is a fact what does um, 
Vedanta say about it? Vedanta says you have to get out of this as soon as possible. Buddh- Buddhism also says that. This is not an answer that you can... Uh, even if you get an answer, all those 24 answers if you get, you still will not be satisfied. What will satisfy you? Ending the suffering. Ending the suffering. And you can become enlightened and free of the suffering and so can everybody and that's the whole goal of it. To transcend this limited state and go beyond suffering. Yes. The gentleman here? Yes. We actually run... Yeah, go ahead. This reminds me of a story that my friend Scott told me a couple of years ago about the mustard seed and the woman whose baby died. Yeah. And uh, she was terribly, terribly hurt, crying and yelling, and she brought the baby to the Buddha. Yeah. And the Buddha says, what can I do for you? He says, bring my baby to life. And he says, well, I don't know whether I can do that for you, but I tell you what, why don't you take my bowl and go to all the houses in the village and ask them for mustard seed from a person who died in your family, did not die. Mm. So she went from house to house and no one could give her a mustard seed. So she went back to the Buddha and she says, I have no mustard seeds. And he says, well, everybody suffers. Mm. Everybody must die. This is what life is about. Yes. Living and dying, not just living, Mm. but dying. So, and she became a, 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 a nun. A nun in the order, yes. And she she calmed like down. Okay. I noticed that these three, three answers to the same question, the suffering of death, one from the Buddha, the earliest one, the next from Jesus, and the last one from the Holy Mother, the three stories. The Buddha story you just heard, that uh, Kisa Gautami, she came to the understanding that death is inevitable. There was no household in the whole city where death had not touched, had not visited. Death is inevitable and therefore it should not be sorrowed after. Of course, grief is natural, but you should get over it. And spiritual quest is the important thing. She became a spiritual seeker, a nun, in fact. So that's one. Uh, an understanding through, through knowledge to transcend sorrow right now. Second, Jesus, Lazarus, come forth. When his very beloved disciples, their brother, uh, I think Mary and Martha, their brother died. And so they were inconsolable. And they said, Jesus, you have the power to raise them from the dead. Raise him from the dead. Again, an impossible demand. And Jesus said that. Lazarus come forth. And he actually came out of the grave and he lived, at least for a while. Uh, What does that show? That spirituality, see, it's not that the, when Lazarus came back to life and then what else? But everybody, he died inevitably and everybody died, including Jesus also. But what it means is that death is not the end. Uh, there is eternal life. Uh, the life beyond death is there. Uh, death is not the end. And spirituality will lead you to that eternal life. That's the second message. Third message is this m- a woman who was a widow and she had a young son who also died and she th- has left with absolutely nothing and inconsolable. She came to the Holy Mother and wept bitterly. And people in the household there, they were surprised to see the Holy Mother herself, Ma- Sharada Devi, wailing bitterly like her own son has died. And after some time, she consoled that, l- uh, that lady, the poor lady, and... God gave her oil for her hair and told her to take a bath and come and fed her and sent her away with gifts and told her to keep coming and whenever she needed anything to talk to him, to talk to her. What did she do? By understanding your suffering. You know, we, we know often that this suffering is, is unavoidable. But what we want is sympathy. Another heart to cry with us. And that's what the Holy Mother did. It was complete someone who is entirely on your side entirely on your side and understands you deeply and feels as you do and then slowly takes you beyond it. So this is the three stories. But thank you very much for that. Let's have a peace chant. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Sri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu